Thank you, Angie, for the introduction. Uh, as she said, my name is Chad Gauger, and uh, I have the uh, opportunity today to talk a little bit about the aquaculture business and uh, the space that I've worked in in the US, here in Indonesia, in Norway, and now in Thailand, covering Southeast Asia and India. And I firmly believe that this, uh, this segment, the aquaculture segment, is part of how we're going to feed the world by 2050. So I hope you'll join me for these 10 minutes and we'll talk all about it. Firstly, though, I'd like to thank the EAT uh, organization for inviting me to be here today. And uh, I'm excited about the two days that we have together to, uh, to talk through how we can sustainably feed the world in the next 20 to 30 years. So just a quick note about Cargill. Cargill is, a, uh, is an American company that's been in existence for 152 years. We're still a private company. Now the seventh and eighth generation is the, uh, is the ownership. We have 155,000 employees across 70 countries. And we work throughout many, many aspects of the, feed, excuse me, of the food business. And uh, we talk about the efficiency and the desire to reduce waste. Our goal is to work efficiently with moving areas of uh, supply to areas of demand. And so I'll speak only about the aquaculture business, but that's what we do as Cargill. There was a comment made earlier by Peter about how businesses are starting to get sustainability. And I'll, I'll make a personal comment about that. So Cargill two years ago bought the largest salmon feed company in the aquaculture business. And that was a clear uh, signal by Cargill that we believe in this space, that aquaculture is a sustainable way that we're gonna feed the world in the future. And we had an aquaculture business as Cargill globally, but we stepped up our game by owning, it's actually the second largest acquisition in Cargill history to own uh, this large salmon company. And now we're talking about how do we step up and use that technology and use that know-how throughout the global aquaculture space. So our uh, vision is it's about healthy seafood for future generations. So it's about how do we help farmers today succeed, how do we produce safe, healthy protein, and how do we do it sustainably. So I won't spend too much time on this chart because we've spent quite a bit of time on these topics already today. Uh, as everyone knows, we'll have nine to 10 million people by 2050. But one thing that I will mention is about 50% of the world's population today is living in an urban area. And we anticipate by 2030, that will be up to two thirds of the population. And with that is a drive toward uh, middle class incomes. Once people move into urban environments, their chances at earning middle class levels of income goes up. And there's a very high correlation between moving from the, uh, a lower level of income to a middle class level of income. And then that correlates to uh, animal feed and animal protein consumption. So people move from a plant-based diet and when they have the chance and they have the disposable income, they very often move into a more animal-based diet for their protein. So if you look at this chart, you can see the continued growth in animal protein consumption between now and 2030. And you can see that top bar is the dark blue is, is seafood. And so clearly one of the largest segments that's growing the fastest is the seafood segment. And when you look across the globe, you can see that uh, today, average consumption globally is about 20 kgs per capita. But there's certainly some big differences by culture. So between the developed world, the developing world, uh, you can see China has a huge bar there relative to, uh, to their population. But you can see on the right-hand side the relative growth rate. So 2% in the, in the developed markets, uh, but m more than 10%, excuse me, in the developing and 9% globally. So, this segment is going to grow, and it's gonna grow at a very fast rate, nine to 10% over the long-term future. So if we talk about population growth, and we talk about people earning higher levels of income, and therefore demanding more protein, uh, let's talk a little bit about why seafood ticks a lot of the right boxes when it comes to um, seafood consumption. So there's a very wide variety of seafood. So, I've seen estimates that say 300 different species of fish that can be consumed every day. That's a lot of different varieties that you could have on your plate every day. It's versatile. So you can have it fresh, you can have it frozen, you can have it uh, canned, you can have it smoked. There's lots of different ways that you can prepare and preserve seafood. It's nutritious. A simple number is that 150 grams of seafood is 50 to 60% of the average adult's daily protein needs. That's a very efficient way for someone to get the protein that they need in order to be healthy. It's affordable. 
especially in developing markets like we have here in, in Asia Pacific, very often seafood is the, is the cheapest protein that's available to the population. And so it's a critical way that people are able to provide for themselves and their families the nutrition that they need. It's also very efficient. And this is the one point I always make to people. I, people always ask me, well, why is aquaculture such a big deal? Why is it the future? And I always say there's two reasons why aquaculture is the future, is it's because it's by far the most efficient. And they say, well, why is it efficient? Two, two words, gravity and cold blood. A fish does not have to waste energy trying to stand up and move around, okay? And it's cold-blooded. It doesn't waste any of that energy trying to stay warm in a cold pond, okay? So all the energy and nutrients that a fish or a shrimp eats is converted to body mass. So today in the salmon industry, one kg of feed equals one kg of fresh fish at the end of the process. You can't get much more efficient than that. Most of the species that we grow here in Asia Pacific are anywhere between 1.2 and 1.7 feed conversion ratio. So 1.2 to 1.7 kgs of feed equals one kg of live animal at the end. The only thing that's even comparable is poultry. And I would say swine is nor usually north of three and beef is about seven. So there's quite a bit of difference in terms of the efficiency you can gain by growing aquaculture. It's environmentally friendly, as I mentioned, the more efficient you are in producing protein, the lower your footprint is in terms of the environment. The second, there's no fresh water use. They're growing in the water, so there's no fresh water consumption in aquaculture. And thirdly, there's no greenhouse gas emissions. Certainly there are from the ingredients that often go into the supply, so it's not zero, but the actual supply is not putting off methane, it's not an animal that's, that's converting and, uh, and digesting and therefore producing greenhouse gases. Seafood also has a very high economic importance. It was mentioned earlier today, uh, some statistics about how many people in the world uh, are uh, work with aquaculture or fisheries. The estimates I've seen are 12% of the world's population works in fisheries or aquaculture. So it's a huge demand, uh, sorry, it's a huge amount of people that's livelihood is impacted by the aquaculture sector. And it's socially responsible. If I look at the farmers that we have across this region, all of them are very small stakeholder farmers. And we're often dealing with people that are working in some of the smallest farms at some of the lowest levels of income, trying to make themselves a better life and trying to provide for their families. And so when we talk about education, the, the ability to help a farmer at that level increases productivity by 50% has a demonstrable impact on that person's welfare and livelihood. So if we agree that we need, uh, that we have more people, they're gonna eat protein, they want seafood, and there's, uh, there's also this hard fact that we have to face that wild catch isn't going to do it. So by the FAO's count, 90% of the wild caught fisheries are not at a sustainable level. So we already today are 50-50 between aquaculture based species and wild caught species. But we cannot grow, excuse me, we cannot catch more fish in the ocean in a sustainable way. So the future growth of aquaculture, uh, of seafood and protein is going to be from the aquaculture sector. So that said, there are challenges in the aquaculture sector. So a couple of them that I'll mention here are education. So firstly, I'll mention consumer education. So we talk about it's healthy. You know, I, I grew up 1,500 kilometers from an ocean. My grandparents never, ever ate fish. When I was a boy, we had fish once a week. Now in my family, we have fish two or three times a week. So you have to help people see that it's easy to cook, it's healthy for them, and they should want to eat it. So you have to change consumer habits to pull the demand higher for sustainable aquaculture. Secondly, we have to provide the story that aquaculture is sustainable. So again, to the consumer, why does aquaculture matter? Why is it the most sustainable system? Help them understand that story. And we have to educate the farmer. So the farmer needs the training and the education, as I mentioned. Many of these are very smallholder farmers. They need that technical expertise on how to make the right choices in how they manage their farm, how they uh, choose feed, how they choose the supplements that they use. So the education is a huge part of what we need to do as an industry to help aquaculture grow. Efficient husbandry is another key aspect of the aquaculture system. So if you think about the genetics and, the, um, and even the fingerlings that you put into uh, the water, the mortality rates in aquaculture are very, very high. So every small amount of, that we can improve on the efficiency 
uh, or the mortality is going to make a very big difference in the farmer's profitability, but also in the supply that we can bring to the world. Uh, a third one is responsible use of medicines. Especially in the shrimp industry, there's been, uh, there's been issues with antibiotics showing up in product into the EU or into the US. And so this is a training thing that we have to do with farmers. We have to teach them how to use medicines, if they should use medicines. Better yet, teach them how to proactively manage their farm so they don't ever need medicines. So there's a lot of things that can be done, especially here in APEC, around training farmers about how to prevent medicine use, and then even having more veterinary services available so that we properly prescribe and we properly dose when we do need medicines within the system. Regulations and enforcement. So one thing that I'll mention is that we must um, create an environment between NGOs, uh, certification bodies, um, and other uh, governments so that we have a sustainable system that everyone can know and believe in. It's transparent. And most importantly, the customer needs to see and the consumer needs to see that transparency. Lastly, I'll mention technology and skill transfer. There's a lot of technology at the high end of the market, poultry and salmon and other species that we must transfer into uh, the segments here in APEC where the farmer education is so important. And lastly, innovation. Feed technology, novel feed ingredients to replace things like fish meal and fish oil, new cage cultures to use the oceans here in Indonesia or across Asia Pacific to, to farm fish as opposed to fresh water. There's a lot of innovations that can be brought, and we need to continue to push on those things. As someone says, or someone said earlier, we must continue to improve. And uh, every day we're learning new things and trying to apply those within the aquaculture space. So with that, I'll finish my comments saying uh, aquaculture is, I believe, one of the key ways that we are going to close the gap in feeding the world by 2050. It's the most efficient system that we have today. It can be done almost anywhere but especially when you look at two-thirds of the, of the world is covered by water, so we have to use that as a resource as, a as opposed to trying to do everything on land. And lastly, we as a, as a very large feed producer, uh, we will continue to work with other businesses, with NGOs, with governments to try to create the sustainability systems, the certification systems to help build the demand for our products and ultimately create a more sustainable supply of protein for the world. So thank you for your time. Thank you for listening.